welcome to The Foster. I'm Ann Baxter in Palo Alto, California, and with me is artist explorer Tony Foster, who is Zooming from his studio in Cornwall, England. Hi, Tony. Hello. Hello. <laughs> nice to be with you again. So while well, I'm in The Foster and I'm sitting in front of two of your artworks uh, that are part of your Exploring Beauty Watercolor Diaries from the Wild exhibition. And these were both painted in 2007, as you probably remember, in the Kama Valley of Tibet. One, the larger one, is about four and a half feet square called the east or Kongshan face of Everest from above the Kama Valley. And above my left shoulder here is an unnamed rock face looking west from my tent above the Kama Valley. And that is about a quarter of the size of the large piece. It's about two feet square. To start off, I was wondering if you could talk about who was your luminary for, for the Kama Valley? Who encouraged you to travel to this part of the world? Um, well, in this case, it, it was um, my luminary was Stephen Venables, who um, I suppose he wouldn't claim to be Britain's foremost climber now, but, but uh, at the time he was Britain's foremost climber. And, and he, his, he, his fame, I suppose, partly rested on the fact that he was he had set up a new route up the east face of Everest to the summit. Um, and I went to a lecture by him um, where he described the climb and the hardships he'd undergone. He ended up uh, on his own. His companions had all uh, given up and gone down. Um, and he ended up summiting on his own too late in the day and uh, didn't have time to get down again or get anywhere near his base camp or his... Um, his camp, and so he cut a snow seat into the into the snow and sat there all night without oxygen. He he did the climb without oxygen, and he had a, a, and he had no oxygen, of course. So so he sat there all night with no oxygen, 500 feet below the summit, uh, and then found his way back down again, uh, back to the Kama Valley after no doubt an incredibly grueling time. He'd frostbitten feet and uh, all sorts of problems, but. Uh, he still looked upon it as not only as his greatest achievement, but he looked upon the Kama Valley as the most exquisitely beautiful place he'd ever seen. Hmm. Well, you didn't get to quite that elevation, but you did get to over 15,000 feet, I believe. And did you, do you feel that was one of the most beautiful areas you've seen in the world? It certainly was extraordinarily striking. I mean, we, 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 went, we got into the Kama Valley, but well, we didn't actually go into the valley. We could see the Kama Valley from our vantage point. But we were higher than the valley, of course, um, and we got in via the Chola Pass, uh, which is 16,400 feet. So that was the highest point we, we needed to go to for that particular journey. Um, and uh, I mean, it is, it is a dazzlingly beautiful uh, vista of Everest and, and a very unusual one. Very, very few people have ever seen it. Um, and so it did feel like a real, ex ex real exploration and a real adventure. Why did you know this would be the, the perfect site for a large painting? I mean, obviously you can see Everest from there, but what else? Um, well, um, simply because, um, you know, you, the, you, you don't just, at least you hope you're gonna see Everest. It's not always, it's not always necessary you are going to. Um, you hope you're gonna see Everest, but you're looking at it along a valley, which of course uh, automatically leads your eye to what you consider to be the subject of the painting. Um, and so, it gives you a great sense of distance and an extraordinary variety of landscape really from the, the kind of scrubby green grass down in the bottom, which is where the yak herders will come to feed their yaks in the summer, um, all the way up to, you know, the, the, the icy heights of, of the world's greatest mountain. So uh, how could it not be the most extraordinary um, vista really for a landscape painter? The, the actual view, the site of Everest is very brief. Um, and most of the time I was spending just looking to see what I could find to paint and hoping it was all, I'd put it all in the right place. It was like, it was like trying to do a jigsaw puzzle without having the box lid in front of you to look at. I mean, it was yeah. you know, just, you just hope that it's all gonna to fit together somehow. And fortunately it did. Were the flags actually where they are in your painting and the stack of rocks was yeah. there? Yes, the stack of rocks is of course to guide the yak drivers down uh, there. Um, sort of stupa really in, in order to guide people onto the path down uh, uh -huh. and yes the flag the flags were there yes of course they were. yeah yeah i would consider this painting to be one of the um 
major achievements of my life, really. Um, I mean, I, I discovered after I'd done it that, that nobody else has ever painted all three faces of Everest. Um, I didn't set out to do that particularly. It's just that that's the way it happened. Uh, and afterwards, I thought somebody said, oh, but nobody else has ever done that. And, and they looked into it and sure enough, nobody else ever has. So, so that too felt like an extraordinary thing. But it was just, it was just having felt having really battled through all sorts of difficulties to get there. Uh, mm -hmm. And then having managed to produce what I consider to be a pretty nice painting, uh, it did seem like an enormous achievement and, I, and one I've never forgotten. Yes. I think part of it is the grandeur of the, just the size of it, of painting a watercolor that size out in the elements is stunning. You get lost in it because of the scale. Oh, thank you, yeah, yeah. So your souvenirs in these artworks are very compelling as they always are. You always include some um, either found or painted or gifted objects to help describe your sense of place of being there and painting. And um, I'm wondering, they usually have stories and I wonder if you could talk about the souvenirs in these artworks. Um, well, the, in the large painting, um, the souvenir, the souvenirs are quite symbolic. Well, in, they are in both actually, but in this painting, um, the souvenirs are a, a silk kata, which is um, a scarf, a silk scarf really with, with uh, Buddhist uh, um, iconography on it, which the Sherpas will hang around your neck the, before you leave. It's a, it's a symbol of affection and respect really. And so I always left um, Kathmandu or, or Tibet uh, bestrewn with or beribboned with, with six or seven of these scarves which had been given to me by the porters and the Sherpas and my friends. And, um, and I was always very moved by that. And, and so, that, so that's a, a, a Buddhist symbol really of, of their, their generosity and religion. Um, and then because Tibet is in fact, of course, ruled by the Chinese, although it's a profoundly Buddhist uh, country, um, uh, I've wrapped it up in a Chinese newspaper and sealed it with Chinese seals. That sort of symbolizes the fact that Chinese are trying to, to uh, suppress Tibetan Buddhism. And, but you'll notice that the, the scarf is still protruding out of each end, uh, symbolic of the fact that I, I hope they never succeed. Um, so, that, so that's the, the um, symbolism of that particular one. And on the little painting, um, it's a, as usual, it's a map and a stone, I think. Yeah, stone. I, I mean, stone, of course, you know, is symbolic of everything. The Buddhists carve into it. They, uh, but of course, it's, it's what we're looking at. We're looking at, you know, a huge, an enormous rock in the, uh, the most in, an enormous rock in the world. So to have a piece of it, uh, although it's been <laughs> washed down from, from great heights, probably, um, uh, you know, is, is obviously, obviously very direct. But also um, in that little painting is um, a terracotta Buddha, uh, which there again has been wrapped up with the Chinese newspaper sealed up with a Chinese seal. And, uh, but there again is bursting out of its wrappings. Well, uh, so here you are at the very high altitude in a blizzard, and I'm wondering if you could describe how you how you altered your painting technique in those in that environment, as opposed to painting in the rainforest or underwater, or whatever. <laughs> but um, I know you often paint with gin, to, so so your watercolors won't freeze. But any other tricks? Yeah, I used I certainly used gin um, uh, because it was bitterly cold sometimes. But as I say, the, the, the major change in technique for the big painting was simply having to kind of assemble the painting from what bits I saw uh, each time I looked. Uh, and I was constantly having to climb 400 feet above camp uh, and uh, you know, sometimes could only work for a few hours because a blizzard would come driving in and there'd be nothing you could do. And if, of course, if you didn't climb back down again, you could easily get yourself lost. Um, and so, and so um, luckily my, my chief Sherpa, Bang Puri, would come up and, and say, uh, Tony, say you've got to come down. And so if he said so, then I would do what I was told. Um, and and uh, sometimes he would say, it might not last long. So we'd sit up there under an umbrella, the two of us, and wait for it to pass. And then I would just carry on. Um, but it was pretty tough going, I must say. And there were times when I just thought, this is hopeless. This is a ludicrous way to make a painting. People are wondering about the clothing that you wear when you're sitting still painting at 
you know, in a blizzard at high elevation. And um, you've said you don't really wear gloves. You something about it. You don't get the frostbite. But um, any special clothing? Any wear your hiking boots and. Well, yeah. Well, I mean, just you just wear every shred of clothing you possess, basically. I mean, it, it, you know, it's down jacket, um, fleece underneath that, a, a fleece underneath that, a, um, a woolen undershirt, woolen long johns, you know, um, merino wool, which is the good thing about merino wool is that you can wear it for three or four weeks and it doesn't stink. Um, <laughs> and so, so I always recommend merino wool to people. Um, and then padded, padded trousers on top of ordinary trousers, which are also fleece lined. And of course, uh, boots, thick socks uh, and a uh, hood and a balaclava helmet. Uh, um, just so that, you know, the only bit of you showing really is, is this bit. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And just try and try and keep every bit of you out of the, out of the wind that you possibly can. Um, mm -hmm. But it still gets damn cold. I mean, there's no pretending that you're co toasty warm because you're not. Yeah. Damn cold. Yeah. Yeah. And to hold the paintbrushes and pencil and do your work, you have to have some flexibility in your hands. So you have yeah, to, yeah, can't be yeah. frozen solid. Yeah. Anyway, one of my favorite paintings, and other people who visit the Foster often comment about this little painting that you painted in your tent while mm -hmm. waiting for the blizzard to die down, hopefully yeah. die down a little bit. And mm -hmm. it resonates with so many people. And what do you think? Like, what were you thinking when you were painting that painting and why do you think um, people are so drawn to, to it? It's funny that, isn't it? I don't, I know, I've noticed that before that people, if I could have sold that, I could have sold that painting 20 times over um, uh -huh. um, because people do just love it. And yeah. I've never have been quite sure what it is about it they like, but um, I guess it's the, the kind of directness and the honesty of it. The fact that, you know, I'd sat in my tent all day in a blizzard um, reading, book, reading a book uh, the next day, the blizzard was still raging, and and it was so. I got so bored that I thought, oh, I've got to do something. And you know, I'm here to paint for God's sake. Um, and I, so I looked out at the tent flap, and that was the only thing I could see. So I thought, okay, well, I'll paint that. I had no great aspirations for it, and no expectations either. I didn't imagine that it would turn into a successful painting, but it does have about it that sense of immediacy somehow. That it really does look as if, you know, the person who did that was looking exactly at that at that time and yeah. and and I guess that's what people like it's just very direct and mm -hmm. and um it, I mean it's not it's not a subject is it in in, in technical terms it, it would you wouldn't look at that and think oh there's a lovely painting that piece of rock yeah just a nondescript piece of rock but it's got yeah. that it's got the that weather sense. intensity it, it, yeah. yeah it's just the and the story behind it I suppose that, that, that I mean you know the, the yaks were dejected everybody was you know, the, the, all the Tibetans were sitting in their tent all day um, drinking rakshi. Um, and they were pretty fed up and they were worried about their yaks. So they were quite concerned. Mm -hmm. um, the yaks couldn't find anything to eat because the snow was too deep and the mm -hmm. ground was frozen solid. Um, and so everybody was just worried, really. Do you have, a, especially, you've already told us some great stories, but an especially memorable moment that was challenging or somehow joyful or whatever that you could relate? Mm. Well, I suppose, um, I mean, get, getting to know the Tibetans was different from getting to know the Nepalis. The Nepalis are just open, friendly, easy to talk to, immediately just generous and hospitable. The Tibetans are much more reserved, partly I think because they, they're, by, you know, they've had years of being under Chinese rule, so it makes them quite suspicious. Um, and so they, um, they were much harder to to get a relationship with, but by the end of by the time we started coming back from painting the Cholar Pass, they had, I guess, realised that what I was doing was a kind of serious pursuit, mm -hmm. and they and they began to to uh, what should I say, l loosen up and become much more friendly. Do you have anything else you'd like to add for the archives that we haven't covered? For the um, Valley? Well, I did run to write. I did want I did write in my diary. I was in my diary the other day, and I wrote about this trip. This is the most expensive way of having a bad time I have yet devised. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for your time, Tony, and thank you for sharing your gifts of your art and your storytelling with us. You're very welcome. Nice to talk to you.